Welcome to Movie Shortens. Follow us today to a movie titled Elevator. Be aware, there are spoilers. In the opening scene, we see a rather somber looking man making a device using a soldering iron. He soberly explains to someone that this could prove fatal to anyone within a five meter radius. We then cut to a view of New York where we see Mohammed looking at what looks to be a homemade greeting card. Panning across the city, George is getting dressed while repeatedly reciting a joke. Meanwhile, Maureen and Don share a kiss over a cup of coffee in their expansive apartment. A pregnant Celine clutches her prominent belly lovingly in her bathroom. Next, we pan to Jane in a nervous state sitting in what appears to be a small, dingy bedroom sipping liquor from a hip flask. At the same time, a soup-clad Martin steps into a yellow cab. Finally, we are introduced to Henry, a well-dressed businessman and his granddaughter Madeline, who asks him if the night is going to be boring. Arriving at the foot of a skyscraper, these characters make their way towards an elevator. First comes the tall, handsome, but rather impolite Don and his fiancée Maureen. The security guard at the elevator asks them for ID and soon recognizes Maureen as a TV reporter. Clearly, he's a fan. They are joined by one of Don's colleagues named Martin, who appears nervous. He is expecting the boss of the company, who they've never met, to be at the event later that evening. The fourth arrival is George, the event's comedian, who declares that he is borderline claustrophobic and so he pleads with the security guard not to overload the lift. He seems quite agitated and uncomfortable. Jane, who is walking with a stick, is helped into the elevator by a guard and is soon followed by Henry Barton and his young companion. He is asked for ID, at which point Madeline suggests the guard not be such an idiot. As he looks for the ID, Don interjects, telling the security guard to check the name on the front of the building. Henry is, it seems, the big boss. Just as the doors are closing, a final member of the party, Celine, arrives. Despite George's protest, she is allowed to board. As the lift begins to ascend, George is clearly uneasy, shifting his weight back and forth. His eyes are fixated on the floor numbers above. Martin tries to reassure him, telling him that this elevator has never broken down. George says that this would be his worst nightmare. Madeline, intrigued, asks her grandfather why George is so concerned. The mischievous young lady then notices the stop button and slides back its protective cover. Looking directly at George, she pushes it. The elevator comes to a halt. George reacts angrily and aggressively, but she claims that it was only an accident. George knows that it wasn't, but the others don't realize it. With Muhammad's advice, Henry attempts to get the elevator moving again by pressing a series of buttons. However, we then learn that the brakes are stuck. Concerned at the lack of movement, Henry requests help via the intercom, but the assistant shows no interest. There seems to be no help in sight. George then begins to drink from his flask to calm his nerves. He argues with Madeline and Henry, saying that he has been fired from his gig as a comedian for the night's event. The conversation soon turns to the purpose of Henry's visit. Martin asks Henry if he is about to retire, and he admits that he is. During this conversation, Jane interjects, suggesting that Henry can, because he is due to receive a $75 million payout. She then asks George for a sip of his drink, using it to swallow some pills. The conversation turns to her, and we then find out that her husband has passed. She is a few minutes from collapsing to the ground. Don then becomes center stage, calling out Muhammad for not being able to help. Celine makes conversation with Don, clearly interested to learn that he and Maureen are engaged. Having been instructed to tell a joke by Jane, the rather alpha Don finishes it for him and tells him it's an old one. George then argues with Madeline, Martin, and Muhammad, who we find out is from Iran. George is Jewish. In the next scene, Celine is desperate to use the toilet as a result of her pregnancy. She uses her bag as a makeshift toilet as others turn away. Martin assists in sheltering her using his jacket. George, however, sneaks a peek, then makes an inappropriate remark. With the attention now back on Jane, we learn that she has lost her son in Iraq. Despite this, she and her husband had retirement plans to buy a boat. However, he lost a lot of money buying bonds which rapidly lost value on account of advice from Henry's company and ended up killing himself as a result. Jane, now upset, tells Henry how he trusted her and how unfair the situation is. Henry reacts without emotion, telling her life isn't fair. He asks her why she came. Moving back in time, we learn that Jane was the person in communication with the bomb maker. We see her collecting the device, 
telling him she wants to use it to send a message. We can now assume that this is why she came. In the elevator, Jane begins struggling for air. It seems like she's having a heart attack. Martin attempts to call for help. While on the phone, Jane tells Celine that she has a bomb. Martin relays this information to the emergency services at the other end of the call. Jane has passed away, confirmed by the medic, Mohammed. This information is also transmitted to Maureen's news channel by phone. Maureen then begins filming and streaming the events using the phone. As she does so, the others argue about who should check if there is indeed a bomb. Celine eventually volunteers. First, she checks Jane's bag, but there is nothing, and they all breathe a sigh of relief at this knowledge. They do, however, find a news clipping which contains information about the suicide of her husband. Next, she checks Jane's body. As she runs her hands around Jane's midriff, she announces that she's found something. She opens the bottom of Jane's blouse nervously, revealing a small metal box fastened to her with metal cables. The group falls silent at this revelation. They immediately begin contemplating their escape. First, Don forces a panel in the ceiling loose, looking for an escape hatch. Looking through the gap, he only finds lights. Celine begins to smoke, but Don stops her. She reacts by asking him if he wants to be a good father. Maureen, of course, overhears this and begins interrogating Don. We learn that he and Celine work together and that the two of them have had an affair. As tensions rise, George and Mohammed begin to argue, with Mohammed grabbing George by the scruff of the neck. The others then step in to separate them. On the outside, the situation has made the news. The bomb maker sees this on TV. He hears about the people, including the young girl, trapped in the elevator. He appears highly concerned. In the next attempt to escape, led by Don, the group tries to force the doors open. They realize they are trapped. Don thinks that he might be able to reach the buttons on the outside. He attempts to do so using Jane's cane. At the same time, Madeline begins rapidly pressing buttons on the elevator's panel. Don eventually reaches the external buttons as the elevator plummets down the shaft. Don's arm is torn off as he was unable to pull it back inside in time. The elevator comes to a rest in complete darkness. In addition to Don's injury, Henry has sustained a laceration across his forehead and Muhammad's leg has been injured due to Martin falling on it. As the lights come on, Muhammad assists Don, using his tie as a tourniquet to stop the bleeding from the severed limb. The mood starts to shift as George begins helping Henry to take a seat and Madeline begins to accept some of the responsibility. Elsewhere in the city, the bomb maker has contacted a TV station and is being interviewed while seated on his bed. The interview is seen by the group via mobile phone which Martin is holding. During the interview, he explains that Jane is a good person and that she wanted nothing to do with the situation. He helped her because he'd been friends with her son. He admits that an explosion will be deadly and that an explosion is only about 10 minutes from happening. The major turn of events comes when George decides they should try opening the doors again. The elevator has moved, so perhaps they'll be able to escape. They finally manage to pull them apart with help from Henry. There isn't enough space to escape, and so they allow the doors to close. Unwilling to give up, George asks for help opening them once more. He says there might be a big enough gap allowing them to throw the bomb down the shaft, keeping them from danger. There is one problem. The bomb remains chained to Jane. He asks if anyone has anything sharp, but the only person able to respond is Muhammad, who hands him a tiny knife. It will be impossible to cut through the metal cable, but that is not his plan. Perhaps they can release the bomb by cutting Jane's flesh instead. While Muhammad remains resistant, others agree with the plan. He's unable to go through with it and instead begs the others for help. The only one willing to help is Henry, who it turns out has experience butchering animals. He begins by cutting into the skin near the waist. He soon makes it to her guts, but needs assistance to remove her organs. So Martin and George get on their knees, helping in the bloody operation. Unable to cut through the spine, they decide to try to snap it. The group will divide forces and twist the body from either end. During this debacle, George asks Henry to give everyone a million dollars if they are able to survive. Henry agrees. Before they can complete this, the help that they have been so desperately hoping for arrives. The doors are forced open from the outside and the elevator is raised enough to open up a gap big enough to climb through. Madeline is the first out, with Martin at the rear. 
When it comes his turn, he realizes he is too big and that the explosion is imminent. The now humane George pleads with those around him to help. Unperturbed, the support team tells him they'll lower the lift to another floor. The doors close and Martin finds himself alone with the remains of Jane and the impending bomb. Though distraught, he gathers himself, muttering, I guess I'm the hero. Seconds later, as the elevator descends, the bomb explodes. Now outside the evacuated building, we see George and Muhammad sitting down, looking rather forlorn and understandably shell-shocked. As Henry walks by, George reminds him about the deal that they had struck in the lift, but he isn't acknowledged. Suddenly, George's phone rings. It's his partner reminding him that he needs to buy some toilet paper on the way home. She is clearly oblivious to the events that have just unfolded. Like and subscribe to watch more videos like this, and don't forget to turn on your notifications. That really helps my channel. Thanks for watching.